Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome. My name is Dr. David Gold. People know me as Dave. Um, I'm a vice president of the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health, and I am a chartered fellow and a member of council. I'm your host for today's session. And, you know, as you know, IOSH is the world's chartered body for safety and health professionals. And in su as such, this pandemic has been a, well, I guess, as we know, it's been something tragic, but it's also been something that is a unique opportunity for our profession. And we have held a series of webinars that have dealt with the pandemic. This is the third and final event in a three-part IOSH series of, of webinars of panel discussions called COVID Unlocked as a webinar series. Today, I'm gonna to be joined by four more IOSH sectoral groups to see how the education, environmental waste management, health and social care, and public services have done during the pandemic. In particular, what we'd like to find out today from our speakers is how these sectors have managed to not only innovate, but set themselves up for a brighter future, despite all the difficulties that we've had um, in the past year and a half. So the basic idea behind the COVID Unlocked series is how fighting the virus today saw us innovate for tomorrow. And we're keen to learn how good, uh, good occupational safety and health can enable us to recover and become more resilient for the future. And we want to look forward for a better world of work for everyone. The series has been driven by members of the IOSH sector groups. And over the last two months, we've had panelists from the institution's food and drink industry, from construction, logistics, and retail groups as well as hazardous industries, offshore and rural industries groups, all of whom have given their insights into their, into their industries and how they've coped during the pandemic. If you've missed any of these sessions, you can actually view them from the COVID section of the IOSH website. So how have these sectors that have come together today for today's webinar found ways to succeed and build at least a manageable COVID as usual, if not yet a COVID or post-COVID future? And how have OSH professionals from these sectors helped to keep business safe and their workers safer? Critically, how might their success in the face of COVID be translated to other sectors? The safety and health profession, to a certain extent, in my thinking has transformed a little bit. We've moved from advisors to a key role in how do we look at business continuity? How do we work with people to make things happen in a different way than perhaps we've done in the past? How can OSH people learn from the struggles and achievements of fellow professionals working in different environments? I am absolutely delighted today to be joined by four highly regarded occupational safety and health experts. But before I introduce them, I'd just like to highlight, and you may have already noticed this, that we have enabled transcriptions for this session. So if you find this, if you find that this is distraction, distracting in any way, and would rather the transcriptions or the subtitles be off, and prefer they weren't there, you can simply remove them by clicking on the disabled Trans, uh, the the trans sorry the transcript button on your screen um, and click to disable subtitles. So let me move quickly now into the introductions. Let me first welcome Jeanette Harris of the Educational Group. Jeanette is a grad IOSH member who is a facilities a facilities manager for a large secondary school in Leicestershire. I hope I pronounced that right in England. She's passionate and highly motivated and feels strongly that all employees, students, visitors, and others should be able to work, live, and learn in a safe and constructive environment. A perfect attitude for, to have for today's session. So Jeanette, want to welcome you. I'm really pleased to have you on board. Next, from the Environmental Waste Management Group, I'd like to introduce you to David Reed. 
David's a senior member of the corporate health and safety team of WSP UK, a leading engineering consultancy. Um, David has some 30 years experience in the environmental and consultancy sector and is widely experienced in the management and direction of contaminated land projects together with health, safety, and well-being, environment, and quality support. David, it's great to have you on board as well. Our next panel member is Julia Johnston from the Health and Social Care Group. Julia is a lead health and safety advisor. Julia, you're gonna, please unmute your screen so we can see you. Um, she has 10 years of health and a 10 year health and safety career uh, and experience in health and social care. Julia had a gap from NHS of so nearly three years to gain experience in local government, primarily focusing on health and safety in the health and social care services before returning back to NHS Scotland in 2019. Hi, Julia, welcome aboard. And finally, um, we, have the doc we have Dr. John Moran representing the public services group. John's experiences encompasses activities typically associated with complex public organizations. Working mainly in public health and the educational sectors, John's been involved in safety and health for 28 years as a manager, an inspector, a lecturer, a tutor, and a trainer. He is currently consulting for a governmental body and is due to take up a teaching fellowship at the Uni University of Strathclyde, and I hope I pronounced that right, John, um, next month. So welcome, John. I'm actually talking to you from Boston in the United States of America. Um, and being here, being international today, um, welcoming people from all over the world as members of IOSH. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and it's a pleasure to be with all of you. So thanks for joining us. So I'm gonna move directly. I'm gonna ask our speakers if they would unmute themselves. Um, and I'd like to look at um, some questions that I would like to ask. And I've said to the participants, and I'll share it with you right now, um, this is gonna be a discussion amongst the five of us. Um, it's gonna be like we're having a cup of coffee together and we're gonna be sharing views back and forth on, on some of these different topics. Um, and we want you to join in a little bit later, but if questions do pop up, please put them into the question and answer, as Ben had said earlier, or as the recording said earlier, put them right into the question and answer box. And one of the things I'm gonna ask you, if you do put a question in, Please preface it with QFS, that's Quebec Foxtrot Sierra, which means questions for speaker. Um, and to make sure that if we, we can sort very quickly through the questions and, and try to answer them as we work through it. So the first question that I'd like to ask our four distinguished panelists today is, can you tell us about one major problem or issue that COVID-19 caused for your business or your service? And what did you do differently to be able to overcome it? And I'm gonna be bold here just to kick things off. And I'm gonna ask Jeanette if, if she'll just simply give us a quick reflection and, a, and a, a, a quick answer to the question, if you don't mind. And then others will follow as so we work through all of our questions. Jeanette, the floor is Okay, yours. thank you. Um, so for me, working in education, I think that the hardest thing for us was sort of the management of the building. You know, we've got a sheer, um, we have got a thousand students, 150 um, pupils on site. And it was like, how, how are they going to, you know, walk around and move around the building um, without causing, you know, sort of um, a large case of COVID breaking out? So it was the logistics. Um, you know, every hour, everybody was moving around the building. So that was our biggest issue. And what we had to do was get back to basics and look at what could we do differently to prevent, you know, staff and students moving around. So we actually uh, looked at, you know, all the students having a form room and they stayed in that one room, um, which prevented the movement around the building, which has worked massively well. Thank you. Let me pop over to David. I think my first comment's got to be only one, um, because I think all of us have had a number of major issues to deal with. Um, we'll start with one. We'll start with one. Um, 
clearly most organizations have had a huge thing about transitioning from from office to home working but for us one of the key things for us was actually around keeping site works going uh, and i would reflect that in particularly in the uk during lockdown one there was a lot of mixed messaging from the different devolved governments within the within the UK, and that did make uh, life for us quite hard. And navigating those different messages was a key key difficulty for us. And David, how did you overcome all this challenge? Um, lots of hours spent by a lot of myself and, and, and my colleagues understanding the guidance as it came out. There was a, there was a huge amount of effort on our part but but the business itself really put a lot of faith in us as occupational and, and, and safety health and well-being um, advisors to navigate and advise our business on not only what was the legal framework as it developed but also what was the right thing to do around COVID. Okay great Julia could I have your reflections on the same question? Absolutely one of our major problems was um I suppose the rapid increase of staff being Facebook, Facebook tested and the ability to record the uh, specific masks that they were fit tested to or respirators that they were fit tested to an Excel spreadsheet just didn't cut it. So um, for the recording, um, we, we did have to look at different ideas, look at different systems and to be able to get a system in place where we can pull the data and um, the advantage of taking the accurate records is tracking which FFP3 models were available and the pass and the fail rates for the staff, checking best performance and you know, liaising with our procurement colleagues uh, too, but recording the Facebook testing. Thank you, Julia. And John? I, I think from my experience, so we, we had a, a a fundamental issue in a, a governmental agency which I'm working for, um, there was a, a lack of appreciation of their relationship with respect to uh, governmental health and safety and whether they were included in that uh, umbrella or not, and, which, and it turns out they weren't. So they had to have a whole fundamental look at their health and safety management. And, um, and, and we approached, and within that, there are obviously specific issues that they needed to deal with uh, innovatively. And one of those was um, well-being. And they introduced for, for people working from home, for example, and transitioning from the office to home. And they introduced a, a specific app uh, developed by the University of Aberdeen, I believe, which uh, is downloadable in uh, staff's phones. And, and they can update their well-being via this uh, new system of communication with their staff. So I thought that was quite an innovative approach, actually. Very good. University of Ab Aberdeen, and, and this is available, openly available, if I understand. Yeah, that correctly. I don't know, actually. That I need to find that out. It, uh, it's called, I think, the. I don't know if the, the app is called Trickle, but the, the software roundabout in which it's, it's able to be uploaded in, I think, is called Trickle. Okay. So um, a link question is, did you find the solution you've just outlined lead to more innovation across your services or across your business? And if so, can you explain to us what happened and how you believe this chain reaction can benefit the business and the profession in the future? Now, let me start with Julia. Well, yeah, um, because we worked with digital innovations on a Facebook testing uh, recording system, it opened all other avenues that we could link in with um, other issues such as clinical sharps. Um, and certainly from our board, we're looking at a clinical sharps rationale, a digital innovation, and uh, so that we can record uh, where uh, non-safe sharps are being requested and we can monitor. And it's making it more lean for the organisation too. Um, we're adding hyperlinks. We're, you know, it, it opens a whole other field, uh, certainly for us to even look at uh, going forward health and safety management systems. Okay, thank you, Julian. David? Yeah, I agree with this thing on the on the digital piece. There's a, there's a, a whole number of things we've done in the business and, and a, lot of, a lot of digital um, enhancements that have been made to make life easier and quicker. We are in a virtual world. So um, in terms of colleagues dispersed widely, 
So that traditional, we're all in the office filling out a form just doesn't work. So a lot of our health and safety um, tools, templates, et cetera, moving towards a digital side. But I'd also pick up on the well-being. Again, internally, we have some apps and tools that are monitoring people's well-being. Um, but I'm guessing we'll say more on well-being as that's been a key takeaway from this pandemic. Okay. And let me move right away to uh, Jeanette. Yeah, I mean, obviously, what I've just mentioned about the issue with the movement around the building. So with um, pupils having to remain in um, sort of one um, location, the thing that we did have to do was to make sure that, you know, pupils were not um, missing out on their education was look at how could we teach differently. And the things that they, they would do is sort of pre-record practical lessons so that students could still, you know, see some of the lessons that could have gone ahead and you know we did sort of like group um assemblies so again it was going back to the the virtual learning um which was able to still go ahead okay super and john please yeah absolutely um the, the move to home working and having to make regular contact with your staff uh, it has been very beneficial in terms of engagement with staff i believe uh, more importantly from a health and safety point of view because the organisation recognised and it was COVID driven and the move to home working that did this for them, they, they recognised that they, their health and safety management system and management approach needed, needed to be developed. It's actually sparked a whole conversation that now means that health and safety is included in lots of the conversations that they, may, that they, they would have had, but may not, may, it may not have included health and safety in the past. So, for example, they do, uh, we do uh, investigations into fraud. And, and that is difficult to interview someone under caution, for example, uh, when you can't be in the same office. So they're now looking to do, and the conversation started about doing fraud investigations via uh, Teams meetings or Zoom meetings, because lawyers are usually involved anyway, and they can be done it via offices. And once again, that solves a pre-existing problem and that they didn't have appropriate offices in the first place in which to carry out those interviews because of the threat of potential violence and aggression. The, the office premises weren't appropriate for those sorts of uh, interviews. And so it, it gets around that particular problem also. So those thoughts about innovating because of working from home and because of COVID may lead to future uh, changes and, and approaches that are actually beneficial to the organization as a whole. Okay, so we've covered two questions so far. And thank you, John. Thank you, speakers. We've covered two questions so far, and we've asked for one uh, innovation that you've used and how this has benefited. I'm wondering if the speakers amongst themselves, rather than being driven by me, have any questions for the other speakers? And I'm just going to go open mic right now. Um, I, I wouldn't, to... Go ahead, Julia. Sorry, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say um, a question, but what I would say is certainly the COVID pandemic has raised the profile of health and safety professionals. And uh, certainly I would say within our organisation, our profile has been raised and I'm, I don't know about the other panellists, what's, what's your thoughts? Yeah, de definitely. I can totally agree. I, I, I absolutely think that, you know, it, it feels like we're being brought into a, um, a lot more discussions. I think that everybody wants to, uh, is everybody working to a common goal? And, and actually it, it's brought health and safety to the top of the agenda for everybody. So I... It's a real positive, isn't it? It has been a real positive. Yeah. Well, let, me, let me add to that question that Julia is asking, and, and, and thank you for sparking this. We're, we're a little bit off the questions, but that's fine. I think it's a, a wonderful question that you're asking. Has the profession changed as a result of COVID? Has your role changed as a result of COVID? And, and are we different as a profession? You know, we, health and safety, we all come at it from different ways. There are educators, there are engineers, there are hygienists, there are medical doctors that are all part of health and safety. But has our profession changed as, a, as compared to what it was, let's say, a year and a half ago? I think, I, oh, sorry. sorry go ahead, you know what? David, please. David, Marshall. go ahead. Okay, thank you. I, I would just reinforce what, what you said, Julia, in terms of our... Um, you know, we are more visible within the organization, et cetera, and, and, and our, our leaders look to us more for support and advice. Yeah. But I think within my field, our role has changed in that it's shifted a little bit more towards health and well-being. 
Um, you know, safety is still there, um, but the health and well-being piece has has come forwards. I don't know five years from the time we would have probably down been down that path. Yeah, absolutely. I do. I do think it's something that we're actively doing on a you know sort of daily, weekly um, basis. And you know, like you've just said, David, it's now on the agenda that you know what we're doing. You know, we 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 do like a well-being survey that that's carried out every week now, just sort of like checking in how are people doing, how are things for you, and and then that's that's a good thing for me. Absolutely, I yeah, think it's it's reflective. Go ahead, go ahead, Julia. No, no, I, I'm just saying that I think it's reflective of the situation last year that everyone has gone through. I know within NHS, there was a lot of uh, innovations and um, national helplines and here for us and lots of things that went on as a result of last year's pandemic. And I think we have to think about the positives that have come out of it. Okay. Very good. John, you've been quiet. Let me ask you if you can reflect on this a little bit. I, I think I'm a bit more circumspect about it. Um, I, I think that having been involved in, I, I, I mean, I appreciate my colleagues will be as well, but having been involved in quite a few accidents, sometimes health and safety is brought to the fore. And then once the accident investigation is over and the reports are in, etc., it then falls by the wayside a wee bit there, thereafter. And so I, I'm a bit more circumspect. I, about how advanced we we are, I absolutely think that we've been relied upon, and I think that's a, that's a good thing. But I think we need to probably capitalise on that at a board level and a director level, in order to make sure that it's not just well-being that's included in the discussion, because uh, you know the the legislative background associated with health and safety is extensive, and 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 our directors and boards need to understand that that is also a prime consideration for them. So it, it's agree. interesting, I think, I think you're reflecting that there is a transition um, to, to involve health and safety more as a result of COVID in the leadership. Um, the, we've talked about well-being, but one of the other things that I reflect on is there have been a couple of significant comorbidities or other problems that are also associated as a result of COVID. Um, there's been a, an increase in stress, there's been an increase in burnout, there's been an increase in post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, Julia, especially in the, in the health profession, uh, but in other professions as well. Um, and things have, have moved in a very, very unique way. And I'm, I'm thinking as we've worked through this just a little bit that um, have we become more risk managers than advisors? in our role in safety and health over the pandemic. And let me ask the, let me ask your thoughts about this. D David, sorry to, to interrupt. I, I, my, I, I have a, a probably different experience on, on the statistics of that in that our stress levels have actually halved and our ab sickness absence rate has halved since people started working from home. And that's an office-based activities. Uh, so I'm being very uh, specific about that. But certainly the, the anecdotal evidence I'm seeing is that, that uh, stress, stress levels have decreased and uh, ab sickness absence rates have decreased. That's my uh, uh, anecdotal evidence towards that. In the public service group for the office worker? Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Great. David, you're... Um, yeah, you're that's, so that's, that's, that's quite that. interesting because actually we've got a slightly different take on that. Our sickness absence rates have reduced, but our stress levels have increased. What we have been able to do, because we've been very proactive in this field, is that we're able to intervene with people who are struggling. And it's been the big issue for us, particularly around people that are home working, is keeping in touch with them, et cetera, monitoring, making sure they're all right. It's interesting to hear other people with their, you know, well-being surveys and apps and what have you. So although the numbers in terms of sickness absence, including stress, in terms of days lost are down, the actual number of people suffering has increased. And it's, inc you know, it's, it's focusing our minds on doing a lot more to support them before they just go to the GP. Yeah, I agree with that, David. We, we've, we've been a completely the same, you know, sort of 
spotting and, and recognizing that the people that you know there are issues or there is things that we can do uh, to prevent them from going off okay and julia within the healthcare sector this obviously is an issue uh, yeah. people have had exposures they haven't had people have had fears they haven't had before as we go to understand what what's your what's your take on this last well just from from a health and safety professional point of view, we uh, I'd probably be more in uh, John's camp. Um, uh, the Occupational Health Service has been involved with supporting staff, and you know um, there is available headspace is now available to all staff, both internally and those who are shielding as well. So we have to remember the, the staff that are shielding. We have psychologists working with our staff. A counselling service and there's relevant online signposts our a spiritual care team are working with staff supporting staff um, NHS was hit hard last year of course um, but there is support there from our certainly from the well-being side from the occupational health and uh, safety services Thank you, Julia. Let me move to question number three and just a minor thing for the audience. When you ask a question, please try to type your question in one or two sentences um, so that we can reflect on them easily. Um, question number three is adopting new technologies and science appears to have been a positive feature of businesses and organizations working through the pandemic. Has this been true for you? Um, and if so, how? And I think some of you have already answered that question, but um, any, any further reflection on this idea of new technologies and science working through it? And, and this has led, and I think, well, go ahead. Um, let's just, uh, we may repeat ourselves a little bit, but uh, just a short answer on this one. Um, yeah, for education, yeah, it's been absolutely um, amazing it's it's you know helped to continue providing education at home um, when they obviously the students were at home for um continuing meetings for for the staff um has, has definitely been a, a massive plus for us yeah I would, and it's it's not new technology but it, it was there but we just didn't use it as as much um so virtual learning now virtual awareness sessions and we find it particularly helpful when the HSC came calling and uh, asked about the learning for Ridder COVID, COVID-19. And uh, we were able to give evidence of recordings to be able to say, yep, uh, we've delivered record, uh, recorded sessions of frequent last questions to charge nurses, to staff, and be able to give them that evidence. So it, it has been helpful, yep. Okay, gentlemen. Any thoughts on this one? Yeah, similar to Julia, uh, uh, taking up the opportunity to use existing software, for example, and uh, capitalizing on that because the culture had changed to accept it and, mm -hmm. and, and therefore wanted to move on it. So uh, e-learning has been a big push uh, with regards to the organization I'm coming. Okay. I, I think I would just agree, you know, we've all adapted very quickly to this sort of technology, you know, Teams, Zoom, all these sort of things have allowed us to just continue to work. In, in some cases, I think they've enhanced opportunity because it's not being about being in the right office in the right place. It's about how you perform because you're all doing this in this, this virtual environment. I would just, without going into too much detail, just with a focus on maybe some site work, there have been a few technologies that have been put onto sites to try and, you know, make them safe and get people back onto site safely that perhaps have been a little bit snake oil salesman type thing, but I'll probably not detail that because somebody might be offended. But aside from some occasional innovations that are a little bit dubious, the general working environment has been fantastic. And it's amazing how well we've, um, we've all adapted to it. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to, that, that kind of leads us, uh, David, um, into the next question. Um, <clears throat> and that is, is there an innovation you've made that's been prompted by coronavirus and that you can see working well going forward? And could it potentially work in other sectors? Well, one thing we've been very conscious of is a lot of our work is out in the public domain. And 
through this, we've obviously been, you know, very focused on assessing risk, not just about COVID, but about the risk of the activities we undertake. But we've also been very keen to be clear on justification about why we're working where we're working. So one of the things that we did put through um, and changed within our organization quite, quite dramatically was a much more robust authorization review process around just our risk assessment of people getting out onto site. And that's something we have found absolutely fantastic and, and are, are continuing. So it's part of that digitization piece. Instead of things being done locally, actually we can now see where everybody is what they're doing and as i said you know with regard to covid justifying why they're traveling you know out of region etc good thank you could i ask others for a reflection on the same question i mean for me this was this was a bit of a tricky one because you know what have we done differently to anyone else um the thing that I probably think that we again is going back to the virtual learning and, and the pre recording of um, our practical lessons that I do think has been beneficial for people and what it's also meant is that you can for those students that have missed um, the, the learning can um, see it at a, a different point and also obviously doing your uh, assemblies in your um, rewards evenings can also be done uh, which was obviously been beneficial for people that say that are you know not able to come into to school for whatever reason okay yeah and, and we would we would probably go with the physical distance and risk assessments there's been a huge amount of work carried out across sectors not just to help in social care but um again it's about managing the risk and something that we should be doing um, in line with any infection risk, but you know, thinking what do we put in place, and it certainly works well in other sectors too. And John, um, public service group is obviously very, very wide in this area, and and you have everything from local government to emergency services to a variety of different people involved. Um, have there been any, is, could, could, you, could you also reflect on the same question? And that is, um, has there been an innovation as a result of, of COVID that you can actually move forward with? So I, I can't speak on behalf of some of the blue light services, for example, or, or you know, fire service, et cetera. The, the, they obviously have particular uh, uh, specifics that, are, that would be related to them. But from, from general public services group, uh, much, much like uh, Jeanette and much like Julia, really, and, and that it's existing, existing materials that are now being applied more effectively, I think is probably the way to, that I would describe it. And, and because, and once again, I come back to it because I think it's actually important because the culture has changed and because the view of the health and safety advisor has, hopefully, uh, changed in terms of uh, for long-term commitment to health and safety. So I, I, you know, for us, the focus has been quite on homeworking. And so that's been e-learning, DSE assessments via e-learning, self-assessment, et cetera. Uh, but more importantly, I think from an organizational standpoint as well-being and, and the use of the app and various other tools that uh, David alluded to uh, has been, they've been utilized in order to ensure that our staff are, are well catered for with regards to well-being. And just in a point, if I can come back to David's point about uh, more people being being uh, uh, affected by stress, but stress absence days going down. That's exactly what we saw too. The, the more people affected, but they were resolved quickly because it mm. tended to be simply as a start of the home working process. And so they, they tended, the, the, the number of stress days went down, even although the number of people was slightly up, but the, the resolution to the problems was, was much quicker than normal. Okay, so I'm just going to pop over to one particular question that I see in front of me and ask the three of you the question, did you find the amount of solutions presented to your organization or your business uh, from the market overwhelming and confusing at times? <laughs> David, you're chuckling. I'm gonna just jump right to you. Well, it, it, you know, this is this is turn the clock back, isn't it? A, a, a little bit, but yes, you know, in 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 the middle of last, or I suppose this time last year, um, wow, we were getting lots of things thrown at us. Interestingly, with hindsight, a lot of that focus was about keeping people in the office, 
when you know we'd all gone home um so yeah all i would say is it, we did get thrown a lot of a lot of stuff um as it was because of the nature of our works a lot of it wasn't really that relevant but um yeah I, I, my laugh gives it away okay other thoughts on this from um, other panelists if i if i can i, I think in public service there the we don't tend to be inundated with with uh, people offering solutions because the, the whole procurement set up, the whole way that you have to interact with governmental bodies or local authority bodies is really quite difficult at times. And so what, what I found was we tended to focus on what our, our, our internal colleagues were telling us and the risk assessments that were coming from, for my for example, governmental bodies like the Scottish government, et cetera, and, and how to approach the problem. So we therefore then approach that question from what can we do in order to meet what's what's expected of us and uh, uh, you know as health and safety advisors someone like me would go out and and look at particular on e-learning training packages etc and try to come to a, a professional judgment about what was best for the organization in which we work and operate I'm going to go to a second question and then I'm going to go to the other two questions but I'm going to go to a second question from the audience because I think this is another interesting one uh, this comes from David Plant, and normally in law, uh, the word guidance is not absolute. This normally is a best practice industry standards, which can be in many occasions be substituted for other controls. As the UK government used the word guidance as a more stringent legal force, did any of the panel have difficulties in applying the COVID-19 government guidance? And was there any resistance from your areas of your organization or industry due to this ambiguous use of the word? Please keep your answers short on this one. Um, any thoughts on this as we work through? Well, I would say from, from our perspective, it was about local risk assessment and how to apply the guidance. And the key thing was um, taking that pragmatic approach, but ensuring that you're um, taking that local risk assessment and how would it work safely within our organisation? Yeah, I agree. I think I think, you know, every time that the, the government guidance came out for, for, for education, you know, we would sit down, look at that and then apply. How would that work for us in in our organisation and, and how would that work practically for us? Was there any resistance within um, for me? No, there wasn't actually. No. Okay. Uh, from my perspective, this is this is a topic after uh, right, it touches touches to the core of, of my interest in the whole thing. Um, I, I did find sometimes the guidance difficult to apply, but it, but it's all based on risk assessment, obviously, and you, you seek knowledge and help from your colleagues in order to apply that. But also, there are some specific things that I think probably still need to be looked at and addressed, and that's you know guidance around COVID risk assessments and in, in non-direct risk uh, premises like office premises where you know it's a respiratory illness uh, and and according to Kosh respiratory illnesses don't need to be uh, treated as a health and safety issue so uh, there needs to be a, a, a there needs to be some recognition of where the law applies and where it doesn't apply so that we can we can judge that accordingly in any advice we're giving to our, our seniors okay david before i go to the next question do you have a response on this one yeah just or? quickly sort of in, in a way repeat what i said earlier certainly within the united kingdom the fact that there was diff there were different rules in, in the different devolved nations that made things tricky but i would say from from our perspective a lot of our focuses was almost beyond what the guidance was it's are we doing the right thing rather you know morally rather than necessarily worrying too much about the specific line is it guidance is it law you know is it a rule um yeah, well, I agree with that. We went against it, of course. I, I, that, that, that's a really interesting point, uh, David, I, and I totally concur with that, actually. And, and from my perspective, I think, I think you know, it, just as an aside, there, there are some, uh, when you work for government agencies, for example, there are political considerations in those choices also at, at times, and you need to be you need to be aware of that political backdrop uh, that, that's taking place also. And, and that's where the law, from my perspective, plays a vital role in terms of the sort of guidance that someone like me might have to give in a governmental agency. I would agree, John. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let me move to another question that um, 
we've thought about a little bit in preparing for this. And to what extent would you say that workers have contributed to positive ways that your business, your organization has responded to the pandemic? Open mic. Fabulous. Well, would, well, go ahead, sorry, John. Sorry, did you learn you go? No, no I, I would say throughout the pandemic and um, what's been evident is the teamwork I demonstrated and certainly from our organisation, from executive directors to domestics to, you know, our team infection control and all levels within health and social care and the, the seeking the innovations have been embraced because we're looking for solutions. But, you know, we are mindful from a health and safety professional point of view is the legal and the organisation obligations that we need to meet. So it's, it's about those seeking the so solutions so that we can meet the legal obligations, but also morally make sure our staff are, and patients and visitors, contractors, so on, are safe when they're in our environment. Thank you, Julia. John? Yeah, totally agree with that. Uh, uh, absolutely. Um, I, I would say that it's been uplifting in many ways to see the way that staff have responded and the way that they've uh, come together to try to make sure that people are okay. And, and uh, I, I've been hugely impressed by, by my current colleagues and the way that they've approached the problem and, and just, just gone for it and tried to fix what's, what's in front of them. It's been very impressive. Yeah. I, I echo that because with it, you know, sort of, I, I feel like it's, it's, been, it's been a journey that we've all been on um, and I feel like we've been on it together. And, you know, sometimes when we've, you know, looked at how we are going to manage things, you know, everybody bought into that and wanted to get involved and try and support each other, um, which was, in, you know, it was refreshing. That shared yeah. experience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I can only concur. I mean, I, I think the people I've worked with, the, um, the response has been fantastic. If you were to turn the clock back, you know, 18 months, we didn't see this coming. You would never have believed the changes that have been needed. Uh, it has put a lot of burden on people. I think we do need to recognise that. And we've obviously commented a lot on that. So I think it has been hard for some people and, you yeah. know, within our organisations, et cetera, and, and it continues to be so. But in terms of just how on earth we've continued to keep the wheels turning, I'm quite impressed, if I'm honest. And, and the, I, the, the old saying that necessity is the mother of invention. Um, I think there's been a lot of inventions that have come forward. But again, I think our profession has also changed to a certain extent. I'm going to, I'm going to go to one or two quick questions at the same time before we go to our last question. Um, Edward Yee asked, was the control measure of class break rotation or staggered end of school days adopted to reduce mass student exposure? How do the team work through adopting this approach with students if it's applicable? I guess that's for you, Jeanette. That is for me. Um, we did both actually. So what we um, had to do was obviously they um, arrived um, at different times and, and left at different times. And with the staff road to um, the lesson changeover, um, it would all be done at, at different times as well. So they had staggered breaks. Um, so it was very complicated. It took a long time to sort of um, put together and it was it took a lot of um, involvement from different departments. So it, it, it wasn't an, a, even though I said that this was the hardest challenge and it did take a lot of work. OK, and another interesting question that has come up in question and answers is a statement from um, Shonaga Metfin, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, and if I haven't, I apologize. I worry that the focus on well-being targets individual responsibilities for their own health, eat well, exercise, etc., whereas prevention of harm is squarely in the employer's sphere. Um, we've also seen absence fall through the floor at a large social care organization. Is it presenteeism on the increase? David, you're nodding. Maybe yeah, I, I think there's some good points there. I would say, yes, there is some individual responsibility there, but certainly I would turn it around and say within our organisation, you know, we're asking line managers to, to basically enhance that, keeping an eye on people. You know, it's not necessarily about what you're eating, what you're doing. It is about keeping an eye on people. Clearly, as part of the whole stress thing and the well-being where, you know, we're talking and people home working. We're talking about exercise and nutrition and all that sort of good stuff as well. But 
I, I think it's more that we're looking out for each other rather than focusing on individual responsibility. The presenteeism bit, I think that was a, an issue for people in offices that you know you're present, you're seen to be present. But I think the virtual world, I'm sure we'll all recognise, we're working more flipping hours than we used to because it's easy to go to your laptop. Yeah. And uh, I a question from John Baker is, do you think mental health and well-being as a result of the pandemic will be a primary focus in the next year or so? John, what do you think about that one? So once again, I'm, I'm circumspect about, about uh, well-being. I think, I think the term well-being from a, you know, and having taught lots of students like yourself on this, it's quite a nebulous term. And, and I think we need to hammer down a better definition of it going forward, because in terms of health and safety, um, we, we need to be clear about what we're talking about when we're talking about psychological risk. So whether well-being is, is a combination of health promotion or whether some people include it in the occupational health bracket, and we have specific legislation for that, or whether people uh, think about stress risk assessments. So, for example, what I would say to that is, as an organisation, you will see lots to do with individual stress risk assessments, but not a great deal in the public services, I, I would submit, to do with organisational stress risk assessments, whether, whether it's part of group, uh, a, a whole group problem or whether a specific departmental problem, etc. So I, I think it's difficult. Okay. And um, Jeanette, Sarah Walmsley um, asked, do you anticipate COVID controls continuing in schools, even if government lifts controls for the public on the 19th of July? Now, that's an interesting question, actually, because it is something, obviously, that we are discussing. Um, I think what we will be doing is sort of waiting until the guidance comes out and, 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 and meeting um, as, a, as a department and as an organisation and talk and maybe caution may be taken on that. And, and it, it, it's going back to the uh, managing um, sort of people's well-beings um, in education. So I, I think caution may be taken. Okay. Um, an interesting question that came from Paul is, have you had many workers refuse to come back in or express concern? And if so, what was your approach to reassuring them that your place of work would be COVID secure? I think that's a great question. That is a great question. <laughs> um, so I think we're about to hit that. And I think I don't think it'll be huge numbers, but I think that uh, as a staged approach, and which is, I think, the, probably the way that most organisations will, will go about it, uh, uh, public organisations anyway, um, where it's essential workers first and then people whose well-being may be uh, adversely affected by the approach. So it's that balance between health and safety, homework and DSE workstations and well-being. I think that the, the HR and, and how contracts are, are organised are certainly going to become more important as we move towards those sorts of difficulties. But I'm hoping that it will be few and far between. I would say, um, John, it's about that balance. You hit the nail on the head just by saying balance. And we do need to balance the risks to the individuals and, of course, running an organisation um, as well. Because mm -hmm. we've had staff that have come in because of working from home um, didn't suit mm. them because they were isolated and so on, but it was about risk assessing once again. Yeah. Um, interesting, there's a couple of questions in the, in the question box that I'm, I'm going to actually um, hit because I think it's, it's interesting. Um, a friend and colleague that I've worked with in China, uh, Mike Kazi, um, asks, what do the speakers believe they need to do more of to prepare travelers for safety, health, and security as they return to business trips? My view is that this will return faster and more fully than media and commenters might, commenters might uh, indicate currently. How can we leverage this shift in awareness of EHS or OSH to provide better framework for traveler risk management? And that in parentheses can can absolutely include trips for schools, local groups, national or international. Um, I think it's an interesting perspective, the, the travel perspective. Um, any thoughts? If I could just say, in terms, 
for us there's two elements to it but this is you know speaking from my business not necessarily the, the the ewmg where we have international travel this is a big focus for us at the moment as you can imagine international travel drastically reduced it's now starting to open up we put a lot of effort into risk assessment around this at the moment but a lot of that is around just the changing environment and the restrictions put on it within the uk we during the main part of the pandemic as i mentioned before a lot of emphasis on internal travel within the uk and whether it was justifiable moving forwards i think it links to the anxiety piece that's a big part of for us some people coming back into offices it is how they travel back into the offices um, as we go forward i'm hoping that John's not entirely right with some of his scepticism and we'll maintain a higher level of virtual working and, and we won't all have to jump on a train for meetings. But I think it's a really interesting question is how that travel piece opens up. Thank you, David. And I think I think this is this is a very interesting discussion because um, many of the members of IOSH um are all over the world we have people in the caribbean we have people in africa we have people in asia we have people in the middle east people in north america um and one of the questions that john anderton wrote is do the panel does the do the panel have any experience of dealing with health and well-being for international companies who have many construction sites in many different continents countries and regions and if so have they learned about the impacts on health and well-being worldwide? I don't have any experience of that, if I'm honest. No. Nope. I only have Sorry. second-hand uh, experience from uh, students doing dissertations on, on subjects akin to that, and uh, but no, no direct experience. So if, if I could answer, I think within the organisation I work for, we have you know, uh, it's, it's a global organization. Within the occupational health and safety community, we have been in contact, particularly if I turn the clock back a year, particularly with regions where the pandemic was hitting them first and trying to learn from their experiences on how they manage things. Um, we're now doing the other thing, which is trying to learn from places that are opening up a little ahead of us as to how that's affected them. So for example, Israel, how, how work's happening in Israel at the moment, relative to our stage of vaccination in this country. Um, but construction sites, I think they've all been managed in a sort of similar way in terms of the experience we have. Okay, thank you. Um, Clive where it asks, what about, the, what about the building compliance, the closing and opening of buildings in the public sector? Has this been a real problem? Um, for me, no, because um, throughout the pandemic, um, we were always um, open for key, uh, key workers, students. So we always were in our building. So we were always making sure that our compliance um, checks and, and, you know, were, were being completed. But I do think that's an important point because I do think that sometimes COVID took a president over um, everything and people did forget about the, you know, there are other other health risks and things that we need to continue to do. Okay. Uh, I I have not, it, it's not been a, 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 a f in the feedback that I've been receiving that it's been a particular problem. I think there will be issues that are problematic for any sort of organisation, but in general, I think it's been fairly, fairly straightforward. It, it, there was a bit of a panic to begin with when you, you had to get out of buildings and, and set up uh, systems that may not have existed and that maybe took four to six weeks, for example, really quick response time in public organisations. But really, the close down has been relatively well managed as far as I can see. I would agree. Um, John, uh, being a public service as well and having buildings um, across the sites and yeah, it's still being managed. It's still another risk to be managed. Yeah. OK, there's an interesting question that has come through. And we still have 25 unanswered questions in the chat box and unfortunately, regretfully, we're not going to be able to get to all of them directly, but perhaps there is a way um, that we can respond um, to some of these questions amongst the panel. But um, Kasmir Ezuno, if I'm pronouncing this right, has written, 
what will your approach be to some workers who refuse to take the vaccines? This is a little bit touchy, but let's see if, um, let's see your thoughts to this one. Oh. Well, the law, we can't force people to take no. the vaccine. No. And so no. you, 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 but the, the NHS, and I'm sure Julian knows about it, have a, in, in Scotland have a great tool called COVID age assessment. And you can, you can plug in various issues into that that will give you a, an indication as to your risk for COVID infection. And, and that can be included in your overall risk assessment for, for whether you return to work or not. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. It, it's something that you uh, currently, you know, it's not law and we can't force people to do that. Okay. Uh, I, I, I think but, we have to also focus, you know, in the UK, it's not law, but as an international organization, we need to look at the perspective from different countries around the mm. world. Um, and it, it, it can indeed um, be a challenge. Um, Lily Samala writes, with the introduction of new HSE policies like enhanced home working, adapted risk assessments for pregnant mothers and work transportation to others, how can employees and employers mitigate a good occupational plan with the transmission risk? Any thoughts? It is a back, back to risk assessment. Um, and that's all we can do is look at the, the circumstances, the environment, and uh, the current controls that are in place. So back to risk assessment again. Okay. So I think that the three, there's three big topics there that, that, that we would be looking at. Uh, Julie, the same would be the local infection rate, the individual susceptibility, and then the procedures you put in place within, within the organization to which you're returning. Let me move to the last question that the panel was circulated amongst the panel. Um, and again, we will try to get to, uh, we will try to answer in writing or some mechanism to um, get everyone, um, every question answered that we can. Um, but I, I think it's interesting that um, the question, do we see a bright future post COVID and are you confident that your business or your client's business or your organization will build back better as a result of COVID than it was before? And if so, why? And I'm gonna ask each, each um, panelist just quick short answer to reflect on this question. Um, and then I'm just gonna ask the, I'm gonna ask a very brief question of, of all four panelists um, in summing things up. So um, would anybody like to tackle this, um, start with, with this question, first of all, do you see a bright future post COVID and are you confident your organization will build back better? I would say yes. I think we've all learned lessons and uh, we've built on our own resilience and uh, it's certainly reflecting with other health and safety um, professionals within the health and social care. We've enhanced our skin, skills. It's been a tough experience a challenging experience with lots of complexities, but we have enhanced our um, skills. And so, yeah, I see a bright future within health and social care. Thank you. Yeah, with for, for education again, I feel feel like we've like we've learned a lot. I think um, we've learned that actually going back to basics is sometimes always um, is not a bad thing. And actually challenging the status quo that just because that's the way that we've always done it doesn't mean that we always have to continue to do that. So for me, I do think that we have learned a lot. Thank you. David? I think the flexibility of working arrangements that have developed through this, um, I sincerely hope that we maintain them. Um, the yeah. Virtual working, the not jumping in a train or a car all the time for a meeting when you can do it over the oh, oh, like this. I, I sincerely hope we maintain that into the future. Okay, thank you, John. Yeah, totally concur with that, all of that. And, and, and I think that, that it, what it's done is it's, it's sort of dissipated any real problems about home working in terms of how it can be managed and how effective it can be for certainly for office based environments. Uh, and, and I think it can have major environmental uh, uh, help going forward as well with the reduction in travel, etc. Brilliant. Could I ask each of the three speakers in closing that, and again, I apologize that we're not able to get to all of the questions in this period of time because we, we still have 27 open questions, but give me three key takeaway messages um, that you have. If you would note down what we feel that we've learned today in our discussion with each other, 
what would be the three key takeaways that, that you would have? And, and let me start with John. It, for me, it was the, the opportunity for health and safety to be more influential. That was the first one. And I think that we need to capitalize on that. Secondly, okay. it's the relationship to well-being. I think that we need a, a, a tighter delineation of, of, of the, the definition of well-being so that we can actually start to make inroads on it and what our role in it is. And then my own personal thing, and it is a personal thing, is about the law. I'm really interested in the law and how that relates. And I think there are some, there are some uh, difficult issues for the health and safety executive in relation to how it implements the law around COVID. Brilliant. So if we can, um, without, re without repeating, um, are there other things that we can add to this, Julia? Um, I would say never underestimate the power of a risk assessment. The risk assessment is just not that piece of paper. Learn lessons from our experiences and innovate to move forward. Okay, brilliant. Jeanette? They've just said two of mine. Um, collaboration. I think the one thing that has been amazing is 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 no matter what sector you work, work within, that you know, sharing best practice is essential. Brilliant. And David? Um, on the risk assessment piece, let's remember all risks. Don't just focus on COVID. Mm. Um, as health and safety professionals, I think we've learned not to be afraid of change. Uh, and then finally, just around that going forwards, we've talked about this already, just that anxiety of some people coming back into, into the working environment. Just we've got a duty to recognise that. This has been absolutely brilliant. You know, I, 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 I'm, myself, some of the things you're saying truly resonate. Um, this whole idea of having more influence, moving from the advisory role to a stronger role with the with the boardroom, getting up into what is called the quote C the C suite unquote, and being called upon to work that way, which is truly strengthening the profession. The concept of risk assessment um, is is truly has truly emerged. And also at the same time, the hierarchy of controls that we do as a result of risk assessment, that in, the importance of that has also emerged. People have all of, a started, all of a sudden started to understand these things and the, it becomes the topic of conversation. Now, even the word PPE on the bottom of the hierarchy of controls, more people are throwing around the term PPE than I've ever heard before. Um, also this whole idea of different styles of work, homeworking and working in, in different ways um, I think this is this is quite important. The idea of, of um, mental health and well-being, which is one of the priorities of IOSH in the IOSH vision. Um, the idea of collaboration and best practice. I think all of these are brilliant. And I would like to really express my sincere, heartfelt appreciation to the panelists um, for a very interesting and an insightful discussion. Um, I would like to express my thanks, my sincere thanks to Jeanette, to David, um, to, to John, um, and to Julia. Um, each one of you have participated in this webinar, and I think this is, you've made it, you, you've actually, you've actually contributed to a point where the, the whole is stronger than the sum of its parts. You know, I think we've, we've come out of this in a, in a stronger way. And for the people that have been listening, again, those of you that we haven't answered your questions, I'm sorry we couldn't get to the questions physically, but we'll try to find a way of, of dealing with it. Um, you'll also find, um, all of you will find other information and previous seminars on the coronavirus website. Um, and this is it for the COVID Unlocked webinar series but there'll be other series coming shortly in building health and safety practices in the new world. And we'll be focusing on what comes next and just follow the website and you will do that. So for me, um, as your host, as um, a member of the presidential team and a member of IOSH council, um, I'm really pleased to see you here again. We want to thank all of the participants um, there's right now sitting on the call, there's over 273 people. So thank you everyone. And please stay safe, stay healthy, stay well, and look forward hopefully to seeing you face to face sometime in the very near future.
Thank you.